Welcome to this ATA Insights webinar. Thank you for your ongoing interest and support of our webinar program. Today's session will begin in two minutes. ATA Insights webinars is an online platform for the dissemination of professional renewable energy knowledge across international borders. Our aim is to democratize access to information, for innovation to spread faster and to make the industry more competitive. And we do this through our online session, open to all our members. Every year we do more than 100 sessions with over 250 speakers, 50,000 attendees from more than 50 countries. To participate in the session today, use the chat on the right hand side to introduce yourself, your company and where you're joining from. Under the screen you will find the Q&A box where you can send your questions for the speakers. We will get to as many as we can today. We're recording this session and we will send you a link to the materials in a few days. Please consider supporting our content creation for the webinar program. Contact us on the email on screen. Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar on designing and constructing the next generation of PV projects in Africa. Um, today, as you can see on screen, we're here with uh, Prasad Mande from Trina Solar, Marco uh, Tramis from ATA Renewables, and uh, Guillaume uh, Duan from, um, the, from Green Yellow. So I will actually uh, stop sharing the screen so you can see us uh, all now. And um, great. Well, um, you know, thank you very much for being with us today. I will let each of the um, other speakers introduce themselves uh, briefly. So uh, uh, Prasad, if you could please introduce yourself briefly. Okay, sure. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, hello everyone, my name is uh, Prasad Mande. I'm the key account manager and head of Trina Pro Business at Trina Solar and looking after Middle East and North Africa region. Thank you very much, uh, Prasad. And uh, Guillaume, if you could please introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. So hi everyone. So my name is uh, Guillaume Durand. Uh, I'm the chief operation officer for Green Yellow for the, business, for the Indian Ocean Business Unit and I'm looking for all design offices, uh, project and construction, as well as operation and maintenance for PV and energy efficiency for Green Yellow. Thank you very much, Guillaume. And then uh, Marco, uh, please. Yeah, hello everybody. Uh, so I'm uh, Marco Dramis. I'm working with uh, ATA since uh, 2010, even though in between I've been working with other renewable companies. Uh, now, uh, during the last years, I've been focused uh, uh, in the MENA region especially, so North Africa and uh, Arabic countries, uh, working as a program ma project manager and also senior technical advisor in uh, special intenders, uh, where we are uh, working uh, strongly with uh, uh, some clients. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. So, and, and well, you, uh, for those of you who are new, I'm Carlos Marquez. I uh, work at ATA Insights and I'll be your moderator today. And um, actually we have a, a tradition here uh, which is to, uh, we encourage everyone to uh, write in the chat to uh, say where they're connecting from. So um, I am actually connecting today from Berlin, which is not so sunny, so. Um, right, so, well, and today we have uh, the format, uh, is, uh, is a round table uh, format, and we'll start with the um, first question, which is, uh, um, you know, in the opinion of a panelist, uh, the panelists, which country markets do you think will grow uh, faster in Africa and, and the most, and, and why do you think that is? For PV, of course. But maybe Marco, you'd like yeah. to start? Yes, Carlos, uh, I can start with this, so it's okay. Uh, so basically, uh, before answering the question, I would like to introduce uh, very fast uh, the, some background on the on Africa continent. So basically, since uh, I was in ATA when we started working uh, in uh, South Africa and projects in 2012, if I will remember. Uh, so South Africa was the first country that uh, started with the PV, and then uh, right after uh, Morocco, 
uh, Kenya, Egypt, and other countries also uh, joined this uh, uh, beautiful sector of the renewable energy. Uh, so currently, uh, after uh, so many years, uh, maybe more than 10 years, uh, we have seen that uh, many countries also in the central uh, uh, region of Africa is uh, working also, even though in a smaller uh, size, so smaller uh, plants like um, microgrids, and uh, so not only utility scale, like uh, in the past. And so we, are, we have seen uh, many participants of this uh, uh, in the PV sector in Africa. And I think that uh, now and uh, in the future, uh, we will see many countries involved in this, uh, in this uh, technology. The best one or the one that, that could grow more, um, I don't know, I cannot say that, but maybe Morocco in terms of gigawatt uh, is very strong. So we are working now in uh, North uh, PV2. We've been working, uh, been uh, working in the past in the North PV1, which was the first uh, uh, phase with uh, only 72 megawatt PV plant in uh, Ouarzazate. And there are other projects, uh, PV projects in Morocco. And now with the North PV2, we will have uh, another gigawatt uh, or more of PV projects in the next uh, few years. Thank you very much. Uh... Marco and um, you, uh, Guillaume, um, where do you see growth in the for solar energy in the African continent? Yeah, what we have, uh, I, I, I rejoined the opinion of, uh, of Marco, obviously, on the regulatory framework, which is the key, uh, the key driver, in my opinion, for the development of a country and the commitment of uh, uh, government and uh, regulatory uh, bodies. What we have seen so far, uh, in Africa, we have seen, obviously, and I think there is a consensus on that about around uh, South Africa, which has a huge uh, potential, uh, both from utility scale, from CNI, and on residential, obviously. Uh, where on the Indian Ocean, uh, we see a huge potential as well on Madagascar, because, you know, the electrific electrification rate of the country is quite low, it's 15 to 20 percent, and the government is uh, giving a big push. On that big incentives uh, so we are pushing our development uh, over there so uh, on the countries we are working currently i would say south africa and madagascar are big 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 driver and uh, i would take as well a smaller island where i'm based uh, mauritius <laughs> uh, and we can see as well that thanks to the effort to the, of the government the their, their willingness to increase the share of ENR is uh, pushing every day and uh, every year we can see on budget new objectives, new uh, uh, incentive as well. Of course, there won't be like utility scale like uh, we can have in Middle East or uh, other big country, but uh, if there is a common effort, we can see as well that even on smaller island, uh, there can be huge potential. Great. Um, yeah, definitely. And, and Prasad, um, you know, where uh, you're working, you know, across the, the continent. So um, where are you seeing uh, interest in uh, renewable energy and in solar power uh, more, more precisely? So um, I definitely second the opinion that Marco and Verme had uh, on this topic, but um, in terms of the markets, I see there is a great demand coming in from South Africa, uh, purely because of the legislative push. Uh, in the market, uh, recently they have concluded RMIT program, and there was a great interest from uh, many of the developers um, making it a very successful bid. And uh, alongside, there is also a focus on RIPT Window 5, which is currently in progress, and there is a lot of interest from international and renowned developers to be part of RIPT 5. So, in terms of the uh, you know, Key big markets. We I definitely see that uh, you know South Africa is one of the markets. Uh, but alongside uh, what we have been seeing is a huge growth in terms of the CNI distribution or residential segment uh, from the countries in West Africa like Ivory Coast, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, Senegal, for an example. And these countries or so these markets, although they uh, in terms of demand supply gap, although they are limited in terms of size of the market, but they have demonstrated clear keenness and interest to deploy renewables. And we are seeing many projects of utilities still happening in that region or in these markets as well. And, um, you know, Prasad, regarding, um, 
you know, the segments of uh, that will be growing? Do you see it more um, in the markets you have mentioned? Is it predominantly utility scale or will it be also more on the distributed, uh, with there'll be growth on the distributed side? Okay. So the way it is, uh, let's say, distinguished is basically, you know, the uh, former segment, which is utility scale, is more driven through the policy push, whereas CNI and uh, residential, let's say, uh, these segments are more driven by the commercial merit that they uh, have in built in them. For an example, talking about West African market, uh, just citing as an example, the electricity tariff of utility is uh, significantly higher, which basically means the electricity produced from solar energy is much cheaper. And therefore there is a commercial driver for the people to adopt solar energy, whether it's for a residential application or CNI application. When it goes to utility, definitely we are looking at uh, policy push, for example, in South Africa, which brings big scale projects to come to the reality. I don't know if uh, either Guillaume or Marco could add to, to these question on the segments. Yeah, I mean, what we see again, and uh, I, I insist again on this uh, regulatory framework, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really depend on the, on the policy of each country. Uh, South Africa is going utility scale, is going CNI and is going residential as well, which is excellent for them. And they need that to overcome their, their difficulties and the ESCOM situation, of course, and everybody is aware about that. Uh, Mauritius, for example, is pushing more on the CNI sector because utility scale, there is no room for that. Uh, and Madagascar is pushing towards uh, microgrids, okay, and residential as well. There are some opportunities on the utility scale via, via big, uh, big tenders. Uh, but I won't say there is one uh, solution, which is the or one segment which is predominant. But uh, I think if all the segments are represented in each of the, of the concerned countries, then there will be a success. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, from my side, I also agree with uh, Guillaume. Um, basically, the framework, uh, uh, the regulatory framework is very important uh, uh, across uh, Africa. We've seen uh, maybe in the past that uh, some countries, uh, uh, let's say stronger countries, have been uh, advanced. Uh, they have uh, they had some advanced advantage uh, compared with other countries uh, like uh, South Africa for, for sure. Uh, Egypt also with the Bemban uh, two gigawatt I think uh, projects. Uh, also Morocco. Uh, so those countries uh, had uh, some advantage, uh, and uh, we have seen a very important development of uh, utility scale PV plants. But now we are seeing uh, that also the microgrids, uh, uh, like in Nigeria on, or other central areas of uh, the continent, uh, are starting to be more uh, stronger. But uh, for sure, the, we need some kind of uh, uh, framework that will also help for financing and to promote this uh, kind of uh, uh, technologies in the in the continent. So everything is possible. Maybe, one, maybe one more comment, Carlos. Excuse me, Marco. Sorry. Um, all that is possible if there is an efficient planning as well, in my yeah. opinion. Uh, it's not just deciding that we need to, to push the CNI or we need to push uh, that, that, that. Uh, where we see success is where, the, where there is proper planning. Uh, I mean, at utility uh, level, at national utility, utility level. And this is a key factor to be taken into account. And this is where us professional, uh, whether we are uh, a product manufacturer, whether we are designer, whether we are developers, we need to, to guide them and we need to, to, to give them suggestions. So planning is, uh, is essential as well. Great, that's um, a good point. And um, before we jump into uh, the next question, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that they can send questions through the Q&A box. So, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll answer some of them um, live, but... Um, uh, now I'd like to actually uh, change um, a, a little bit uh, towards technology. So um, I think we have seen over the last 10 years that TV technology has evolved and you get um, bigger uh, wafers and, and you know, larger uh, modules as well. So um, what are the benefits to uh, installers in uh, deploying these larger um modules are, are around 210 uh, millimeters uh, now. Maybe Prasad, you'd like to, to start? 
Okay, sure. Thank you, Carlos. Um, basically, we see China is, uh, you know, forefront when you say 210 mm wafer, uh, wafer or cell uh, based modules. And I'm happy that this question, uh, you know, is raised here. But basically, there are a number of advantages of 210 um, large size wafers and uh, the modules that are based on this technology. First of all, it's a very high end technology product. And uh, it is distinguished uh, by the way the cutting of the cells is carried out. Uh, Trina employs a novel non-destructive cutting which ensures uh, better management of thermal stresses along the edges of the cells when they are being cut. And uh, because of the uniformity and uh, you know, lower amount of uh, thermal stresses that are being produced, uh, it results into uh, almost uh, zero micro cracks. And that's, that's something which is very niche of this technology. Um, in terms of efficiency, this technology is also a notch above when it comes to its uh, industry peers. Um, also, you know, one of the important features is it, it has higher power to weight ratio and lower, let's say, lower weight per meter square. So on both these indices, these modules fare better. So for the EPC, this would be a very interesting point to really, you know, understand how its implication would be on when they integrate uh, into the power plant. Um, second, another important aspect of these modules or these wafers, large size wafers, is it, it deploy, employs um, high density interconnections and that basically uh, avoids overlapping of sales. And again, this is one, one point which is uh, you know, very uh, commonly observed that overlapping uh, of the sales causes thermal, uh, sorry, um, you know, uh, mechanical stresses on the uh, sales which are embodied one over above. And uh, because of the technology in Flood Katrina, we clearly get away with those problems as well. Um, another important feature to touch upon is it's, these modules are uh, wider and shorter. The modules being shorter, they, they, uh, the torque acting on the top tubes of the tracker is lesser than if the modules were longer in the height. And then what it means is basically the trackers are going to be lightweight and it reduces the wind load setting on the uh, tracker or mounting system elements. Um, this is basically uh, means that you have lesser weight of uh, steel used in the uh, power plant. And uh, one of the uh, you know, most notable feature is it's high, these modules are high current versions. So because they are carrying a higher current, um, the strings are, it is possible to have more, more number of modules in the string. For example, the modules that are based on this technology typically have longer strings and up to 37% longer uh, strings. And this basically helps in achieving far lesser number of strings in the power plant, which basically means you will have less number of string component boxes and you know, less DC cables to be used in the power plant. And also, of course, it helps you optimize better on the inverter level so you would have less number of inverters as well. So all in all, just in a nutshell to summarize, these modules uh, based on this technology um, are able to add more value um, when we consider plant as a whole. And at, at a system level, we see that there are significant US reductions. For third party conducted study by DNBGL establishes a number about 1.2 cents uh, of the value addition uh, in terms of BOS cost saving, and which is significant one when it goes to, uh, you know, realization of the big power plants. So, and then when you reduce the capex, that basically means you're improving the LCOE and you're improving the IRAPs from the developers or investors' perspective. So um, that's that's something, uh, you know, on the technology side, and especially speaking about the Trina's product, um, Trina's Vertex series is based on this technology. And uh, this, this technology also employs uh, different, uh, you know, enhanced testing. For example, I see 63126 standard, which is uh, known for the high humidity and high temperature application, applications. And um, Marco, what's your, your view on 210 modules? Yeah, um, let's say that, uh, let's say for, for me or for uh, ATA or technical, technical device or, uh, lenders, so um, technical advisor point of view, where we work in normally for financing, you know, to support uh, financial institutions to provide uh, as much as possible uh, uh, non-risky projects. Uh, our point of view is to that uh, any change in the technology normally uh, provide the more uh, complexity to the to the um, due diligence that we do for lenders. 
So in this case, uh, I understand that technically I agree with uh, Prasad. So the 210 uh, seems to be cheaper module. Uh, perhaps uh, we'll have some advantages and some advantages uh, regarding the installation, the operation of the modules. Uh, but let's say that now currently the 182 millimeters, uh, for example, is uh, a more mat mature uh, technology. So we know that uh, we passed from the 160 to 182 um, technologies. So let's say that there is always uh, an improvement to, to save cost, to reduce the cost and to optimize the LCOE. So uh, let's say that now the 180 uh, plus is uh, more mature in my point of view. Uh, even though the 210 uh, for sure, uh, Trina is uh, using that, uh, is uh, uh, adopting this technology for future. Uh, not only Trina, but uh, Hollywood and other uh, recent other manufacturers, very strong manufacturers. So we believe that this will be uh, very important and will uh, will get uh, you know um, part of the market, important uh, part of the market. But for sure, what we recommend is to do in the in the meantime a very strong uh, uh, strongest uh, uh, requirements for uh, fat uh, factory acceptance test uh, at least to make sure that uh, this technology is uh, an improvement is cheaper but is also uh, as much reliable as possible so reliable at least as the previous one and uh, Guillaume, have you uh, deployed uh, panels of this uh, of this description? You know, what, what is your view on on two ten yeah. uh, panels? Uh, unfortunately, for, yeah, no, no. But unfortunately for Prasad, we didn't take the turn yet for the two for the two ten. And uh, but it, it doesn't mean that we won't take it. And uh, as Marco uh, as Marco mentioned, what we are looking as developer and. Uh, and the installer is a bit old school, but it's uh, obviously uh, efficiency of the panels and uh, reliability. Uh, we normally ask to have return of, of experience. And since it's, it's a quite a new, uh, a new technology, uh, we generally would like to see a proven experience and track record. Um, and the, the other factor that we take into account when we do our design is we always uh, involved in the, when we do the selection of the PV module, our uh, structure, uh, metal structure provider, as well as our installer, because we obviously look for the best techni technico economical uh, uh, situation. But look, uh, we think the 210 is, uh, is, will, will take a big part in the future, and that we agree on that. And, uh, and if I would have to promote uh, and, and support the manufacturer, I would tell them, please continue to have a look at it because uh, and, 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 and future expand on that because it will help us decrease the capex and everything uh, and, and uh, the LCOE as well. Uh, unfortunately, yet in our region, we didn't move yet to the, to the 210. Th th there is as well the aspect of the transport, which uh, 182 is, uh, as far as I understand, and I might be wrong, Prasad, you may you may correct me. It's perfectly fit for the for the for the container and for the for the freight, and 210 is yet to be uh, to be uh, to be optimized uh, on that. Especially when we see the the cost of transport, which is crazy nowadays. Everybody would agree on that. Uh, it can be a cost killer for the for for, for the project. Yeah. So just to add a point here, basically this is, I think, sort of a misinformation spread in the market that 210 base modules, and especially Trina's modules, are transport inefficient. But I can show you the numbers if you if you have a chance to go to the data sheet, which establishes how many modules it could take up per pallet and the total power per, uh, let's say, uh, you know, per container, then we are at least four to six kilowatts higher than the competition in a similar segment of modules, but not lesser. So in fact, we are more transport friendly than the competition, especially the 182 mm. And I would like viewers to also take note of this point. Next time, uh, we, we will be more than happy to demonstrate this on uh, calculation based on the data sheet value that they are. Sure. Well, um, and, um, you know, continuing on the uh, more of a, a technical um, vein, um, there are obviously Africa is a, is a huge continent that is very uh, diverse. You have very dry locations, you have very uh, hot and humid locations. And, uh, you know, but I am curious really when you're selecting a module for a, a hot and humid uh, location, 
are there any special considerations? Are there any standards that uh, should uh, be followed to secure uh, the reliability of the of a project? Um, so I think it's probably a, a good question for uh, technical advisors. So uh, uh, Marco, perhaps you'd like to start. Yeah, regarding the, you know, uh, Africa is not the only continent with uh, those characteristics, but uh, for sure that uh, the central part uh, we have seen uh, also in South Morocco, for example, uh, we have seen that uh, humidity uh, affect uh, uh, really strongly the PV panels uh, and the, in general the PV installation. Uh, maybe more the inverter or the, you know, the system that uh, is made by PV panel plus uh, the, the inverters because at the end, the humidity affect to, to the overall system. So um, let's say that uh, in terms of only the PV panel, uh, we would recommend to increase uh, some uh, uh, requirements of the test. So regarding the IC standards, uh, sometimes we've seen uh, in the MENA region that uh, some of them have been uh, like, let's say doubled. So if we were uh, 200 hours, so maybe to do 400 hours of uh, thermal cycling or the dump heat uh, test also uh, try to, to do more hours or more, you know, more cycles. To, to make sure that the panels are very strong and will be enough uh, uh, reliable to, um, to, to that uh, site characteristics that we are uh, uh, seeing in, in Africa or in some countries. And then regarding, so this is regarding the modules, uh, perhaps thermal cycling, humidity freeze and damp uh, heat uh, test, that one uh, can be uh, increased a little bit to provide more comfort to the financial institutions or to the investors. And then uh, regarding the system, uh, what we've seen um, in Morocco, uh, in some uh, sites that were also close to the sea. So it was not because of what uh, was the uh, humid, also because of the, the presence of the cost. Uh, so the accumulation of the humidity in the, in the morning mainly. Uh, so that uh, affect also the, um, the resistance that uh, is uh, seen from the inverters. So the inverter sees some kind of uh, a, a current that goes to the ground and, and detected some kind of fault that uh, there is no fault, but uh, due to the humidity only, uh, the inverter uh, think that there is something wrong and do not, do not uh, start up until uh, maybe 10 or 11 a.m. So we saw this uh, kind of effects that uh, must be taken, considered when we design and construct a free plant in uh, such kind of uh, environments. So that one was, uh, for example, uh, uh, solved uh, uh, by connecting the negative ground to the uh, the negative pole, pole of the PV modules uh, to the ground. In that case, it was uh, solved. And maybe there are other aspects that uh, you know can, can be very important uh, to be considered. Not only this one. Thank you, Marco and uh, and Prasad. You know, from the um, the modules uh, point of view. So, are there any special considerations when you are uh, installing a module in a, in a place that could be considered hot and humid? Um, yeah, definitely. So FINA has been very particular, uh, you know, about this issue of hot and humid climate with uh, years of experience, uh, you know, selling in these markets. Uh, we definitely do understand the risks of having product in similar situations. And, uh, you know, what Trina uh, recommends as a climate strategy for their product is to go with uh, polyolein, polyolefin based encapsulants, which are more durable, reliable um, for, for the long term performance of the modules. Um, it has been seen that the modules that are based on the uh, normal ethyl vinyl acetate based, uh, you know, encapsulants. Uh, have a tendency to react with the atmosphere and humidity, and therefore it starts to deteriorate faster uh, during its lifetime. Uh, and we have seen an improvement in the performance by three times to four times by you know having a change in the composition of material. So as a matter of Trina's climate strategy, we do we do recommend a product that goes either a glass class, which has you know superior resistance to climatic conditions. But uh, if that's not possible for some reason, people, let's say, stick to backship-based modules, then uh, we advise them to go with the uh, uh, modules that have got polyolefin uh, encapsulants uh, from, from a pure perspective of long-term reliability and performance. Thank you, um, Prasad. Um, Get Guillaume, please. 
Yeah. yeah so, no, no. I don't, sorry, just please pass out. No, no, no. Please, please pass out. Please, please, please go. Yeah. Go. So there is also one standard which is, uh, you know, a special standard which advises uh, rigorous testing or let's say more enhanced testing, like Marco was specifying. You know, there should be enhanced tests for uh, more number of let's say hours of tanked uh, testing. And there is one such standard which is called IC six three one two six. Um, and Trina is one of, one of the companies that have done extensive testing on its product and also got this module certified with the, the state spec, uh, specifically stands for the uh, you know high temperature and high humidity applications. Guillaume, over to you. You look like yeah, yeah. Just, just, just one comment. Um, uh, 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 as I mentioned before, on the on, on the modules, I think the answer of Marco and Prasad was straightforward. But since we are talking about designing plants, uh, when you are on, on specific condition, and Marco mentioned it, when you are close to the sea, when you are in a sandy area, when you are at a high altitude, or where 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 or where you can have gap. Of between high and low altitude and low temperature, uh, be careful on your derating factor. Be careful with your producers. Uh, from on a general standpoint, uh, if we take example in Mauritius on tropical island, if your product are not tropicalized, in few years you start having problem on operation and maintenance. So uh, be careful on that generally, and uh, and and ask as much question. Even even though they sound stupid to your suppliers, but uh, just make sure that uh, it can, uh, for example, a transformer can withstand a coconut, which falls down, uh, and uh, all all that kind of, uh, <laughs> of stuff. Uh, yeah, so it's not just related to the PV module, but just for the entire uh, installation and the design. Think about your condition. I know there is a question about that, and we will go go, go in detail uh, through that. But this is this is a real key factor because it can affect your production by. Uh, quite severe. Okay. Well, I mean, if you want to go through the, if you have identified the the question, you mean, is there a question from the the audience or? No, there, there was a condition about what shall we take into account uh, when we when we go uh, into design with re, uh, relation to uh, to the ground, of course. So geotechnical study. Uh, where you can fail is if you don't uh, take into account properly the drainage system, and if you don't do any hydrological uh, uh, studies, and you have a do if you don't have a proper drainage uh, drainage plan. And uh, I see that Prasad mentioned it as well when you are under cyclonic condition for uh, wind. Uh, lo a lot of people tend to fall to, to to forget that. Uh, and uh, do, do not just limit your studies to what has happened before. But what will happen in the future? Maybe take some security factors. I know uh, developers, competitors doesn't like to put too much uh, security factors because they may increase the capex and increase their or decrease their competitiveness. But uh, we be, we believe in green yellow that you need to anticipate your future. Uh, it doesn't. It's not because in the last ten years you had. Uh, I'm saying maybe 100 mm. Uh, precipitation during the months of November that in the next 10 years it won't double or triple or you know so that's the, the, the kind of thing and, and wind wind is a key factor and in Madagascar, Mauritius, Reunion Island we work under cyclonic condition uh, so it has uh, it has a huge impact and if you don't forget that even from an, from an insurance point of view uh, you can be in trouble. Right better save than, than sorry right I think that's a, a very good point you know considering um, all of uh, the, the data on ground conditions, you know, and, and well, you know, I think, yeah, I'd like to hear uh, Marcos and Prasad's opinion on what needs to be uh, considered and whether this data is, is available. Have you had any uh, challenges getting hold of the, of the data that you need to deploy your projects um, effectively in the, in the African continent. Uh, yeah, from my point of view, uh, basically the project that, that we have uh, been uh, working with the recently, and uh, normally um, I have uh, I didn't see any big issue because uh, the information was uh, provided uh, 
uh, with the, the good uh, detail. So I don't know, for uh, Morocco, Egypt, uh, uh, South Africa, at least for the countries. Uh, also Namibia, uh, we've been working as uh, on engineering for a 40 megawatt PV plant. Uh, also the information, uh, let's say, was uh, available or with uh, the help of uh, local contractors or um, internationally experienced uh, EPC contractors, we could uh, manage to get the information. But for sure, uh, we are talking about the data that are uh, fundamental for the development of the PV plant. Since the early stage of the development, also, if, you have, if we have a RFP, we need to compete with a different uh, IPPs or EPC. Uh, we need to have the, this uh, data, otherwise we cannot, uh, the EPC, for example, is not able to provide the price. If there is no information about the ground uh, situation, uh, overground, underground, geotechnical uh, uh, information, hydrological, uh, seismic uh, risk as well, that is also very important, very important in the central part of, uh, in some parts of uh, Africa. So there are many aspects that uh, must be considered uh, in, in very good details. Otherwise it will be, can be a very big uh, risk. And uh, when you define and design a PV plant and uh, also calculate and estimate the CAPEX. Prasad, what is your, your view on this? Yeah, I think both of our panelists have uh, spoken in detail about the challenges in terms of the data or credibility of the data, uh, the granularity of the data that is required uh, in order to have safest possible design. Um, to our experience, it has been uh, more or less same thing that uh, you know the wind, wind geotech uh, seismic studies. This, this, these studies. Um, and definitely there is no long-term historical data set in many of these markets and uh, especially talking about let's say wind wind code or wind speed preci precise wind speed for over a long-term historical uh, data is definitely missing from uh, you know many of the projects that we deal on and therefore you know the developers uh, you know have to go back and we insist them to basically uh, get a more credible, as realistic data as possible from the local weather stations uh, in order to make the estimations correct. Um, also on the geotech side, the experience has been that, uh, you know, sometimes the protocols are not uh, followed as per the standard SOP set out by the, uh, you know, relevant or applicable standards. So in those cases, um, there is a tendency that you may uh, end up having wrong inputs or assumptions for the design and it could be fatal for the long-term performance of the power plant. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Prasad. And, and there is another uh, aspect. Uh, Marco, did you want to say something? Or should we go to the next question? No, regarding the wind uh, is a very good point because, uh, oh. you know, now uh, we've seen many projects uh, in uh, wind, uh, the regions with the strong winds, uh, with the fluttering, galloping, and many uh, effects that uh, pro can uh, uh, cause very big uh, uh, disasters. So the wind the data are fundamental if we want to work with the trackers in uh, in Africa. Right, and um, well, um, and you know, a, still on kind of project development, there is a, a question that I have on training and development. So is training and development of local personnel a, a key part of um, your plans when you deploy a plant in in Africa and uh, and yeah, what are your your thoughts on this? Uh, look, for, for from our, our point of view, um, all the all the plants that we have in operation, uh, with in Africa or South Africa in the Ocean, our OEM team is always local. Okay, uh, because we need to have people. Uh, at proximity of the site or even based on the site. Uh, we have the policy to train uh, locals. Uh, so for us, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an essential, uh, it's an essential task. And uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we, uh, it's a way to generate a job. And uh, we are talking about uh, countries where there might be a, a very high unemployment rate. And uh, for example, we are doing an extension of um, uh, in Madagascar of 20 megawatt of our plant in Ambatolampi. 
it will it will generate uh, directly or indirectly more than 300 jobs for the next uh, for the next year and uh, we hope to identify people with the right skills and with the right mentality and keep them on site to do all our electrical maintenance and and do everything in house so for us yes it's a, it's a key it's a key technology and it's a key it's a key approach uh, to train them then after of course you need to invest in the training and you need to send the right people and you need to uh, to spend time with them but uh, we believe it's a, it's a good investment Thank you, Guillaume. Marco? Yeah, I would also add, uh, you know, during the construction phase as well, because we have been involved in, as uh, on engineering in uh, some projects, uh, for example, in Namibia, the 40 megawatt uh, PV plant. So we've seen uh, that uh, yeah, for sure that we need to hire uh, local uh, uh, people. So they, they are not uh, skilled. Maybe they, they have no experience in uh, similar uh, kind of uh, uh, works. So at the end, uh, for sure, the EPC contractor is the first one that will uh, uh, provide this kind of experience uh, with the international uh, uh, employees uh, uh, preparing and teaching and training the, the local uh, people that will uh, work during the construction, uh, where we know that sometimes we reach a, a peak uh, of uh, 500 or more uh, people per day during the installation of the mounting structures, uh, uh, PV modules, etc. So. Uh, the training is uh, fundamental, it is very important, and also the presence, uh, what we recommend is uh, to have always not only the experienced uh, EPC contractor, but also uh, owner engineering uh, services uh, and some uh, third party that also supervise uh, uh, the works uh, for of the EPC contractor and also the local people, not only the, not only the local people, but everybody uh, sometimes needs some kind of supervision from uh, third parties to make sure that everything uh, is going well in uh, accordance uh, to, with the plans and the schedules and you know and within the the cost and the schedule basically and also the quality <laughs> i cannot uh, forget the quality which is uh, uh, very important as well and uh, prasad would you like to add anything to this um, yeah, in terms of the local uh, unit employment, it's a, it's a given fact today that uh, PV power plants, uh, regardless of its shape and form, uh, have an ability to uh, you know, create local employment. But while this happens to make most of it, um, you know, we have seen there is a gap in you know, the level of competencies required, uh, especially when it comes to say, uh, installing module or installing trackers to be very more precise. And in such cases, what happens is, uh, you know, the contractor who is, let's say, an international contractor mobilized to a country, uh, definitely they find there is a gap, um, you know, in terms of the skill set, right set of uh, uh, people with the right skill set are missing or at least not available in the required uh, numbers and this is this is one area where you know local employment uh, along with alongside local employment local uh, skill building or let's say training would make uh, you know a lot of contribution and I think uh, the way to go about it is industries um, bringing in products uh, you know uh, to the markets uh, you know have to work closely with the non-NGOs or, you know, those local institutions uh, in order to impart uh, skill building programs. And that would essentially mean that you have, um, you know, skilled people or technicians available uh, to, to adopt these products. And this, this has been predominantly seen in case of trackers, uh, you know, developers are wary or shying away from uh, choosing tracker over fixed rate mounting system because they feel it's a, it's a something it's a high-end product. It needs precision in terms of installation, and the people should be adequately trained. Um, and this is this is where I again emphasize on the point that uh, skill building is something which would definitely help us bridge this gap. And private industries and government would work hand in hand to uh, bridge this gap as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Prasad. It's a very uh, comprehensive answer from all uh, three of you on you know, development of skills uh, and, uh, and local personnel uh, in Africa. And, you know, I've seen a number of questions on uh, South Africa and on the, uh, the um, 
kind of solutions that could be provided by uh, PV power to the challenges that South Africa has now uh, regarding you know uh, blackouts and, and brownouts. And uh, we have a um, um, I think you know I've seen recently that in some cities in South Africa they have opted to uh, uh, deploy uh, distributed renewable energy to uh, to secure their energy supply. So, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this could be a solution or part of a solution to the the uh, situation in South Africa and in other places that are lacking uh, a stable supply of energy? Yeah, uh, my, my opinion is, as I mentioned uh, before, I think the solution in South Africa will come if everything is put in place together. The country is so wide and has so much specificity. And uh, of course, I think the municipality uh, uh, initiative are, are the right one, but it's not just installing a PV plant uh, close to the uh, to, to the town hall, which will solve the situation. You will need to have uh, a storage, you will need to have uh, a capacitor, you will need to have frequency regulation. I know they have gone through as well uh, some willing solution. So where you install a plant on another side of the, of the town or the country, and then the energy is uh, virtually uh, consumed somewhere else. Uh, I, I, I think uh, it is part of the solution. Uh, but uh, it is not the only solution. That's that. That's how I would uh, I would put it. Thank you, Guillaume. I don't know if uh, Prasad you'd like to add something or Marco. Not from my side. Not from your side. Okay. And um, on the um, another um, solution, I've seen. Uh, is having uh, distributed microgrids. So, um, you know, are they a are they part of a solution? Could they be connected later on to become uh, part of a of a wider grid and, and increase uh, uh, electricity access? If I were to respond to this question, I would say that decentralized solutions are definitely uh, the one uh, which brings energy to the bottom of the pyramid. So, uh, you know, people basically, you know, uh, who lack access to the electricity, and especially Africa, when we talk in the context of Africa, uh, not everyone is connected to the utility grid um, or distribution grid for, for that matter. And this is where microgrids play an important role to bring connectivity to each household. And in the middle of this, we see the solutions of the business models such as pay, pay as you go or microgrids coupled with the storage solutions uh, definitely address the requirements of this section. And um, regardless of you know how how this uh, you know small African countries let's say uh, decide to go about having the hundred megawatt power plants, uh, if done in a distributed manner, this hundred megawatt would uplift the life of uh, many you know, many more people than if the central power plant is connected to the grid. Because, uh, because I say that because, you know, the grid, uh, resilience of the grid or reliability of the grid is, uh, is also a question in Africa in most of the parts. So while you build the electricity through the network, there is a great amount of electricity that gets lost to the by means of transmission and distribution losses, which are very high compared to the networks in Europe or in any of the advanced uh, markets. And this is where I think distributed solutions, which are very close to the consumer, will add, uh, make most of the realization uh, of the money spent. And uh, you know, it directly affects and impacts the social uh, economics of the society as well. Um, that's, that's my view of looking at uh, this particular situation. Thank you, uh, Prasad and Guillaume. I I think you've mentioned that you have a project in Madagascar. Yeah, um, yeah, act, 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 yeah. actually, Madagascar is pushing for those uh, microgrids and uh, uh, having some uh, hybrid uh, solution that uh, we are participating in, and we are doing four projects at the time of, uh, as, we, uh, as of we speak. And it's a phased project, so it will be uh, for 11 years. We will increase the capacity. 
uh, every uh, other years, depending on the consumption. Because when you start putting electricity in an area, then people start to connect and connect and connect and connect, and then the, the load will uh, will increase. Where I join Prasad is that it's not necessarily that uh, uh, you may connect that to the backbone or to a network, or uh, specifically in. Uh, in, uh, in Madagascar, imagine the size of the country. If they have to, to build the, uh, a transmission network, it will cost them millions and millions and millions. And other countries in Africa will be the same problem. Uh, so I think it has to be a step-by-step. -step. Let's uh, give access to electricity to more and more people locally. And then maybe in the future, or when they solve their economic problem, or if they found uh, other way of investment, then yes, you need to build a, a, a strong transmission network. But keep in mind that, for example, in Madagascar, the distribution network is 66 kV. Uh, if you want to have uh, for a thousand of kilometers, you would need a 220 at least, or you would need a 400 maybe, like we have in Europe, or uh, to have a, a proper and to minimize the losses. So. In my opinion, microgrids are the right solution for the time being to give people access to the electricity and backbone and connect and, and grid tie will be a second step, which might not come in the, in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, my point of view is uh, similar. So I totally agree with, with uh, both of you. At the end, uh, the current situation is uh, what we have now. So the countries that are now stronger, like South Africa or Morocco or Egypt, in some places, not in the whole country. So where they have uh, transmission lines, where they have a uh, stronger uh, network, uh, for sure they are able to, um, to promote uh, uh, utility scale PV plants. Otherwise, uh, what we have uh, is what we need to consider for the next, uh, maybe not only five or 10, but also 20 years. Because we know that the development is very, very, uh, slow, so the useful life of the PV plant is uh, 20, 30 years. Um, we can consider 30 years uh, maximum. Uh, so at the end, uh, I think that uh, we will need to think about what we have now. So in some places we will uh, uh, go with uh, utility scale, uh, like 10 megawatts uh, or more, uh, up to 50 megawatts or more uh, than, um, PV plants. And uh, for other countries, like also Nigeria, or that uh, we've seen the uh, micro -Greeks as well, uh, the solution is uh, micro grid now and will be the same for uh, seen during the next few years. So at the end, uh, where uh, the necessity of the micro grids, grids is, uh, if there is this necessity, we need to think about it. We need to think about the small PV plants with the uh, battery systems, uh, which is another point that must be considered. So the best system, the battery energy storage system is also uh, fundamental uh, for uh, this uh, microgrid uh, projects, not only then, sometimes also for uh, bigger uh, utility scale projects. Uh, so in Africa, the importance of the batteries will be very, you know, will be higher maybe than in other places. And for sure, the uh, grid tied uh, installations, isolated installations will be also part of the generation in Africa and will be like that for uh, many years. So you think that uh, batteries are important? Uh, why? Because they could increase reliability and and be more of a, be more dispatchable of uh, uh, microgrids and isolated uh, installations? Yeah, sure. Because also uh, we need to think that uh, solar energy we have only during the day. So if this uh, isolated installation, uh, we need to fulfill also the and cover the morning and the night time. So at the end, uh, without the battery, there is no way to, to do it. Maybe we can have a very uh, weak uh, grid that uh, can support uh, a little bit uh, when we don't have sun. But uh, for sure, we need to think about uh, installations, the grid and the PV plant and battery that need to work together. Also, maybe adding wind energy and other renewable energies, so they need to work together to to provide uh, a good quality electricity to the users. And there is a question also regarding DC. I don't know if uh, maybe I can uh, also add uh, an answer to this. Yeah, uh, correct. The question regarding the using DC uh, microgrids instead of uh, AC. So for sure, it is a very good point. Because uh, if we are using uh, isolated uh, installations, there is no need to convert uh, uh, from the PV panel to DC to AC with the inverters. 
but it's better to keep uh, the everything in the sea, uh, store it in the batteries, and uh, of course we increase the efficiency of the system. And then uh, the connection between the systems depends uh, how many microgrids we have. We uh, can be done in DC, or maybe we can convert in AC in a later stage and then uh, use the AC power. But uh, for sure, the DC concept is uh, important and could reduce uh, losses. Thank you, uh, Mark. And I don't know if uh, any of you would like to add to that. Otherwise, there are a couple of good questions here on the. Um, just one, maybe just one, one comment on the use, uh, the usage of storage because it is the future as well. And as as Marco mentioned, it's uh, it's necessary for the for the stability and the quality of the production, uh, because not all of the countries have uh, enough spinning reserve when they start to build. Uh, um, big, uh, big, big plant. Uh, for example, once again, I take the example of Madagascar. Uh, if you have a 40 megawatt, which is connected on the main backbone, and then you have a drop, a sudden drop, then they don't have enough spinning reserve, and then you go for a blackout. So what, another point as well, which is extremely important when designing is do grid study, do your power study analysis, uh, use consultant for that. It's key because Nobody would like after six months to be pointed out and say, oh, look, your, your, your PV plant, which is supposed to, to cut the cost, is creating blackout to the country. So uh, this is a very important point of two, two ways of using the batteries. Of, of course, the, the quality of the, of the production during the day. And if you are lucky enough to have enough uh, uh, sun during the day, then you can move and use, use it for the peak at night. So once again, uh, take it into account when you are doing your design and, and don't, uh, don't do any, any decision on sizing without a proper grid assessment. Thank you, uh, Guillaume. And um, um, well, I think, you know, there is a question here actually on energy modeling. So uh, whether it could play a role and uh, where is uh, that uh, lacking? Any, any thoughts on this? So could, uh, it, the question says, could energy modeling play a significant role in helping facilitate design and construction of the next generation PV plants in Africa? Yeah, as I said, you need, you need, uh, you need to do your grid study and, and, and doing your grid study, you would need to go through the modeling of the, mm. of the, of the network. Uh, you would need to involve the utility, the local utility, uh, once again, don't do that in your corner. <laughs> it, would be, it would be a big mistake. But uh, uh, each big utility normally, or, or each as, as a consultant, who has the model already in hand, and you can do static and dynamic studies, and uh, it will give you even and help you optimize the, your sizing. Uh, you may have thought about, I'm, I'm saying maybe something stupid, a 10 megawatt battery, but then it would demonstrate that a 5 megawatt. Uh, maybe uh, sufficient uh, based on the load consumption and based on the projection they, 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 may, they may have during the, uh, in the coming years. Thank you very much, Yaman. Well, actually, we're coming to the end of, uh, of a webinar. I don't know if, uh, Prasad, if you'd like to say something. Uh, no, I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to see if there is any question for us. <laughs> Great. Well, we'll actually um, we'll send you uh, all the questions so you can uh, choose which ones to to answer uh, by um, email. And well, I'd like to thank uh, everyone who's been here with us, uh, you know, watching the the webinar. And and of course, you know, thank the three of you, uh, Prasad, Marco, and Guillaume, for uh, being uh, with us today. It's been very interesting, and well, I hope it's been useful to um, everyone in the audience. Thank you very much for inviting us. It was a pleasure to share. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. much. Right. Thank you very much. And until next time. Cheers. Thank you very much.